Thanks for joining us this evening, everyone. My name is Dan Campbell. I'm the manager of infrastructure with Northumberland County. Um, we really appreciate everyone that's joined us online and in person to participate tonight and provide us with some input and feedback on County Road 64. Um, so we're getting started now, uh, just a little after 6.30. We're, we're gonna run till eight o'clock or maybe a little bit longer this evening, depending on how much feedback and uh, the nature of the question and answers. Um, so before we get started, if uh, you could just move to the next slide there, Jessica, thank you. So just would like to start with, uh, with formally recognizing the traditional keepers of this land, in particular, our neighbors of the Alderville First Nation with a formal territorial land acknowledgement. So we respectfully acknowledge that Northumberland County is located on the Mississauga Anishinaabek territory and is the traditional territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabek. Northumberland County respectfully acknowledges that the Mississauga Nation are the collective stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. So a little bit about what to expect tonight. So again, welcome. Um, we have a presentation. We hope we're gonna get through it all in about 45 minutes. We do have quite a bit of content, so please bear with us if it runs a little bit longer. We, we appreciate your, your indulgence and your patience, and, uh, and we hope uh, we have some good info there to share with you. So we're gonna start off very quickly talking about the study process, a little bit on the need for the project, and then where we really wanna spend most of our time tonight is on some conceptual high-level improvement ideas around the rural portion of the project, gateways between the rural and urban area and traffic calming, as well as improvement area ideas for the urban area. So that's, that's really the meat of things. And then we're going to move into a question and answer session. So next slide. Just uh, to kind of lay a little bit of groundwork as to who's here this evening. Um, so over at the very far, uh, far to my left here, we have John Gooding, who's the manager of capital infrastructure with the municipality of Brighton. Um, myself, Dan Campbell, manager of infrastructure with Northumberland County. Just to my left, Vanessa Skelton with GHD. She's a transportation planning and traffic engineer and the lead consultant that's working with us on this project. Over back to my right, we also have Katrina McCullough. She's our, our public consultation specialist for this project. And just immediately to my right, although not in the photos, but not any less important, uh, Denise Marshall, who's the director of public works for Northumberland County. Just a very little bit of project background on the next slide. So this project, uh, as we, we have representatives here tonight from Brighton and the county, it's a collaborative project. So Brighton is responsible for the water main sanitary sewers and sidewalks along County Road 64, Prince Edward Street. Um, and Northumberland County is primarily responsible for the road itself and the storm sewer. And then those responsibilities sort of overlap and intertwine into the areas of cycling infrastructure as well as pedestrian crossings, which is definitely something we wanna talk about tonight. This project's moving forward using a municipal class environmental assessment process, which is a very standard and typical process that's followed for the planning of various infrastructure projects. Um, so we're following the Schedule B process for that, which uh, we'll talk a little bit more about. And really what that means or, or is all about is reviewing alternative solutions and options and incorporating public consultation and input into the process. And as I said, we, we do have GHD here tonight with us or staff from GHD. So GHD is the consulting firm that was engaged to help with the, the nuts and bolts design details of this project and a number of other elements. So they're gonna walk us through a fair bit of the presentation tonight. Um, just to set the stage a little bit, uh, I just would like to touch on some supporting county and municipal policies that relate or sort of make the framework for the project. So in the county's transportation or master plan from, uh, from 2017, we're certainly targeting having a connected continuous active transportation system for all modes of use. So not just cars, but uh, pedestrians, cyclists and other types of users as well. And we're building that out piece by piece as we do infrastructure projects. And this is certainly becomes an important piece of that puzzle. The rural section of County Road 64 was identified in the county cycling master plan as a key cycling route. It's also part of the Great Lakes Waterfront Trail and forms a key link there. Brighton's official plan echoes these ideas with getting this connected network of, of trails and pedestrian and cyclist facilities built. And, and one other thing that is, is somewhat, I guess, overarches over some of this, although it's a little bit further in the future, is that previously there was an environmental assessment undertaken for the grade separation of County Road 64, Prince Edward Street at the railway crossing. So putting bridge over or under that EA 
proceeded for or did not proceed forward with implementation. And instead the current safety countermeasures that are being implemented were developed. And sometime in the future, the county certainly still has it in our long-term financial plan that that grade separation would be implemented, but that's after this project would be completed. So with that, I'm just gonna ask Katrina to walk us through a few little meeting guideline uh, housekeeping items, and uh, then we'll turn it over to Vanessa to walk us through some of the technical elements. Okay, great. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, Brighton is very near and dear to my heart. We've already had some really good conversations earlier um, as people were arriving about what they uh, would like to see in terms of improvements. That's really one of the main purposes of tonight is to hear your feedback um, and your suggestions. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping. Obviously we are in person and online as well. Um, the the Q&A session will be after the meeting or after the presentation. Um, so if, if you're online, um, then you'll have the opportunity at that point to raise your hand and ask your questions. Um, I'll go through that at the end as well. Uh, and then if you're in person as well, we'll take questions from the floor um, at that time as well and some discussion. And if you're here in person, um, again, welcome to stay for a little bit afterwards, um, after we break and, and provide your feedback uh, on the pictures, take a comment form um, or provide it online as well. So thanks again. I'm gonna start uh, by just giving an overview of the study area. So it's County Road 64, also known as Prince Edward Street. Uh, and this is an arterial road in the county, uh, which means that it is generally carrying a higher volume of traffic and it connects uh, to other communities. In this case, it connects to Prince Edward uh, County and the city of Quinty West on the uh, east end and uh, generally will connect up to Highway 401 uh, beyond the study area, but it, it, uh, it is a connecting road. It is a primary north-south route uh, within Brighton uh, and is part of the Waterfront Trail. So as Dan had previously mentioned, this is following the municipal class EA process, which has specific steps to be fulfilled to uh, complete the process uh, appropriately. Uh, specifically related to this project, uh, the first step is to assess the need for improvements, and that is improvements with regard to the road and underground infrastructure for this project. Uh, to identify some opportunities for improvement, we will develop some design concepts, uh, examine the impacts of these concepts, and then evaluate them to select a preferred. So in terms of establishing the need for this project, uh, the, there are several elements to it, one of which is the underground infrastructure uh, that we, we can't readily see, but we do have evidence that the uh, underground infrastructure is aging and needs to be replaced. This is based on things such as when it was initially constructed, uh, leaking, uh, for want of a better word, uh, of, of the water pipes or the, the sewage pipes, we do have some uh, camera uh, vision of the, of the pipes. So we do have some, even though we can't see them from above ground, we do have knowledge about what is happening underground. And it's uh, time to, um, it's the time to check these out and assess uh, what needs to happen next. Uh, and also the stormwater uh, it will be assessed and culverts will be determined whether they need replacement or repairs. So that's the need part of it. And then we'll also look at opportunities. So if we need to repair the road and replace the underground infrastructure, what can we do to make the road more what the community would like to see? So this is the opportunity portion. Uh, we have the opportunity to add some type of cycling facility, whether it's bike lanes, a multi-use path, potentially upgrade or widen sidewalks. These are all opportunities for improvement. Um, we also might want to take a look at uh, ways to reduce speed on the road. So that's the traffic calming component of it, uh, as well as potentially make some minor modifications to, to intersections in, in terms of uh, turning lanes. So, 
The study area has two sections, an urban component and a rural component. The rural component uh, is shown in the map here in green and a dashed line, which goes from the east end of the study area at the boundary of uh, County of Northumberland to approximately Harbor Street. And then the urban component is from Elizabeth Street south to Harbor Street. And the urban section is uh, generally uh, in terms of road design has ditches um, and generally has a higher speed, uh, fewer driveways. And the urban section is where most of the houses are. We generally have sidewalks uh, and stormwater is conveyed through piping system. So just to review where we have uh, come from so far, that County Road 64, Prince Edward Street is an important uh, gateway to the community of Brighton. Uh, it is an important arterial road that connects across the community. The underground infrastructure is uh, due to be replaced. Uh, the road surface also needs to be replaced. And we do have the opportunity through this project to make various improvements for active transportation, which is pedestrian and cycling uh, travel. So for the rural section, uh, the improvement ideas uh, include road resurfacing, that's the repaving part of it, replacement of some culverts. Um, the idea is to retain the paved shoulder for the cyclists in this area. Um, as mentioned previously, it is part of the waterfront trail and is used uh, well by cyclists. Uh, there's uh, no intention to widen this road so it wouldn't become a four lane road. Uh, it's expected to retain its two lane uh, road right of way uh, and have uh, potential minor changes uh, at intersections. And then as we move from the rural component toward the urban component, one of the things that we want to look at and, and as an opportunity from this project is to have a transition. So the drivers feel the difference from coming from a rural part of the road to the urban, which will then hopefully reduce the speed um, as you enter. So there's a few ideas uh, on this slide and on the next couple of slides, uh, which relate to speed management. Um, and these are called traffic calming ideas. So the, one of the ones that has been used in the County of Northumberland and other places are these transverse pavement marking lines, which are the white lines that cross across the road. And it's, it's proven successful uh, in reducing speeds no, of it's five to uh, 15 kilometers per hour. And the pattern that's been used is shown in the, in the photo there where you have uh, two bars on the sort of outside of the lane with a bar in the center and um, what, what has been noticed that drivers tend to try to line themselves up, which actually helps also reduce the speed because they're really paying attention to the road. Uh, there's no effect on the snow plowing with this idea and is generally a low cost solution, but does require repavement at each season. Speed radar signs are, are another idea, which uh, let the drivers know when they're um, exceeding the speed limit. And there's different levels of those and different types of signs that can either flash in red or yellow or show you a green or a smiley face when you're doing the right thing. Some of them have a flashing white light. Uh, so there's various models of these speed radar signs and they can be set at, with different thresholds as to when they'll start flashing at you or not. Um, and it's also been shown to reduce speeds from uh, three to 14 kilometers per hour. The next ideas that we're looking at are potential uh, on-road pavement markings. Uh, so the photo on the slide shows a, uh, in a 40 kilometer zone, it says uh, max 40 kilometers per hour on the road so that the driver sees that as they're approaching. Obviously, if it's 50, it would say 50 or 60, it would say 60. So that's one, one option, another would be to uh, use the word slow or sometimes it's stop ahead. So there's various types of messages that can be painted 
on the road. And uh, again, it uh, can reduce the speed. It's been proven to reduce speed from about 16 to 14 kilometers per hour. Uh, again, low cost, but does require uh, maintenance. Then we also have gateway features to introduce the community. So a welcome to Brighton type of sign. Uh, these ones incorporate though also the speed limits. So uh, one of the photos shows a sign on either side of the road and one of them just shows it on one side of the road uh, with the speed limit. It can be combined with some landscaping or planting components, um, some decorative elements, uh, whether it's uh, decorative fencing or, or something along the lines. Again, really to uh, get the driver's attention that uh, you're changing from a, a rural, very open field to a, you're in the town now and, and uh, we would really like you to slow down. Um, then the next one we have uh, is typically installed at intersections, but can also be installed at a mid block location. And these are uh, bump outs or curb extensions. So this is where uh, the sidewalk sort of juts out into the road. The driving lane uh, is narrowed for that portion. Um, and it, it reduces the crossing distance for pedestrians. Uh, there, there's a, a lower reduction in speed than some of the other ones uh, that we had shown. And also it, it's a higher cost uh, solution because it, it does require uh, construction. But that's why this is an opportunity because if we're going to be reconstructing the road, it's much better to try to do it as part of the whole plan than as an afterthought. The last one uh, we have here is a raised intersection, which is a similar idea to speed humps, uh, but it's the whole intersection that's raised from one end to the other end. And those triangular white paint marks show that where the, the change in elevation is. So it starts just um, after the stop bar and then over the intersection as a sort of flat hump and then down again and on all four corners. So the whole intersection is raised and it's fairly effective at reducing speeds because it is a generally just a very large speed hump. So that was our transition piece and trying to go from the rural to the urban section and let people know we're in the urban section now. So the urban section in this project is from Elizabeth Street to Harbor Street. And the general ideas that we're looking at here are new sidewalks uh, and various active transportation options, active transportation being the, the cyclists and pedestrian options. Uh, so that in, includes um, also pedestrian crossings. We're also looking at where we can install these traffic calming ideas, maybe need some turning lanes. And of course the infrastructure that uh, I had mentioned before. Uh, again, there's no expectation that we're widening the road uh, to any more than the two lanes that are already there other than maybe a turning lane here and there. So to delve into the ideas a little bit more. So concept one uh, combines on-road cycling lanes with sidewalks on either side of the road. At the rail tracks, given that this project has just been completed, there's gonna be no change at the railroad uh, as the sidewalk and new pedestrian gates are, are there and, and they're uh, great and glad to have them. Uh, so in between the sidewalk, there'll be a grass boulevard before you get to the road and then the cycling lane. And the next slide actually shows a, a little uh, schematic picture. So you have the two sidewalks, which are sort of highlighted in purple, then a boulevard where you'd have trees or grass and hydro poles and such. Then the cycling lane, uh, the driving lane. And uh, so the pedestrians can walk on either side of the road on either sidewalk. And just to put this on the map, So we've split the, the two sections in the urban area of north of the railroad tracks and south of the railroad tracks. So north of the railroad tracks, there is 
Um, there are already sidewalks in some blocks. So there is the potential to upgrade this sidewalk depending on what state it's in. If the roots of the trees are starting to make it bumpy, in some cases they've already been replaced the sidewalks. Um, so it's really on a, let's look at the, the state of the sidewalk in each block by block location and upgrade uh, if it's needed. Uh, but a sidewalk, continuous sidewalk on either side of the road uh, up until just before the railroad tracks uh, and would include a pedestrian crossover at Richardson Street. Um, and the, the suggested location is there such that when there is a train a crossing and the queue of people waiting for the train is is backing up that pedestrians don't have to try to cross between I know that sometimes the the queue actually gets quite long. Um, but we don't want people crossing like right at the rail line but but back from it uh, is the idea. Uh, and that's what we've been trying to show there and then the on road cycling lanes uh, all the way along, including across the tracks. So pedestrians would cross on, again, the new uh, crossing sidewalk with the pedestrian gates. Um, and then south of the railway tracks, again, we, are, we would put the green areas show where there would be new sidewalks constructed. Um, these are where there is no sidewalk today. And then the yellow shows where there is a sidewalk that may or may not need upgrading, again, depending on a block by block basis, uh, where, where improvements are required. And the cycling lanes continue uh, through this area on road till they meet up with the paved shoulders at Harbor Street. So that's option or idea number one, which has uh, cycling lanes. The second idea that we're bringing forward is a multi-use path. Uh, so a multi-use path is an asphalt paved surface wider, usually three meters, 2.5 meters, uh, which uh, allows both pedestrians and cyclists to use the same area. And in this idea, we would have a multi-use path on one side of the road and um, a sidewalk on the other side of the road. And again, with the one place to cross the railroad tracks, the newly upgraded crossing. And then our cross section here, again shows the, uh, the sidewalk on one side of the road with the sort of highlighted purple person, uh, two driving lanes, and then the multi-use path on the other side of the road. You can see it's a bit wider uh, and that's sort of in a pinky reddy color. Um, and again, we'd have the grass boulevard separating the pedestrians from the roadway. And that's where again, trees, grass and poles uh, would go. Uh, again, in this uh, scenario, the two driving lanes that are existing would remain as, as two driving lanes. They are slightly wider uh, in this option than they would be with the uh, on street bicycle lane option. And then to put it onto the map, um, so north of the tracks, the multi use path would be on the east side of the road and the sidewalk would be on the west side of the road. And then once you get south of the tracks, uh, it would switch. So the, the a sidewalk would be constructed on the east side of the road uh, with a new sidewalk between Lyons and Butler because the crossing uh, would be at Butler again to avoid the uh, queuing of cars back from the railroad tracks so that the crossing is not like right at the railroad tracks but back from it and and, um, uh, and then the multi-use path would be on the west side of the road and that's shown in purple uh, with existing sidewalk again in yellow and then new sidewalks in green. So what are these pedestrian crossings that I keep talking about? So these are, uh, I would say new, but they're not so new anymore. Uh, 2016 is when they uh, came in to be part of the Highway Traffic Act, but uh, they're still being implemented um, 
and slowly but surely across Ontario. So these involve uh, the triangular lines there, which uh, are yield markings to tell drivers that you need to yield to pedestrians. There's a pedestrian crossing sign, uh, which is a white sign with a, a person walking. And then they have uh, flashing beacons. So yellow flashing alternating um, when the pedestrian presses the button. So it is pedestrian activated. You actually have to press the button to make the yellow flashing uh, start. Uh, and then uh, the, the drivers should yield. Uh, it is uh, part of the Highway Traffic Act. And actually on the next slide, uh, it points out that there's a thousand dollar fine and four demerit points for drivers that do not yield to the pedestrians in the pedestrian crossover. So um, sometimes there's a bit of education to happen in a community when it's the first one that they've seen um, and uh, when it's installed. So um, that, that would be recommended as well. In general, the pedestrian who wants to cross presses the button still very strongly suggested to make eye contact with the drivers, especially when it's new in your community before crossing. Um, and if you're a cyclist on the multi-use path, you would cross as a pedestrian, press the button and, and walk across. Uh, cyclists on the road act as vehicles and would have to yield to the pedestrians, just like the drivers uh, need to yield to pedestrians. So doing a comparison uh, of these, these two options, there's cert certain advantages uh, for the concept one of the on-road bicycle lanes and certain advantages for the multi-use trail option. So for the uh, on-road on bicycle lanes, um, each, the sidewalks have pedestrians, the cycling lanes have cyclists, and there's no a uh, conflict between cyclists and pedestrians because you each have your own space to be and uh, the, the cyclists travel in the same direction as the uh, cars. So if you wanted to access a property on the right side of the road, you're, you're flowing and you, you can access uh, properties on either side of the road. Uh, with the bicycle lanes, the uh, driving lanes become slightly narrower. Uh, which also helps to reduce the speed. The pavement markings also for the cycling lanes uh, are, are also part of that reduction in speed potential. Um, there are fewer utility pole conflicts and impacts to trees uh, with the uh, sidewalk and cycling lane um, option. And uh, the, the cycling lanes do continue across the railway tracks um, and uh, uh, in the lanes that they have, there's no need to cross back and forth. Uh, the advantage of the multi-use trail option is that some cyclists are more comfortable using multi-use paths compared to on-road cycling lanes. The, the cycling lanes may or may not have a small buffer space. Again, we haven't gone into design. Uh, so we're just generating ideas here, but that is a possibility that there's a painted buffer or it's just a painted line. Uh, so some, some cyclists do prefer being on the multi-use path. Uh, the multi-use trail attracts different types of users. So you um, can find varying ages and abilities on a multi-use path. Um, and um, it does expand the ability for traffic calming features without impacting the cyclists. And that's because the curb extensions, if a cycle path has to go up and over the curb extension, it just makes it slightly more challenging uh, for the cyclists. And therefore the multi-use option, uh, you can build the curb extension without impacting the cyclists. Thanks so much, Vanessa, for walking us through, uh, through the background and, uh, and those options and concepts. Um, so just gonna wrap up with, uh, with some general ideas here uh, at the end, and then we'll move into the, the Q&A part of the evening. So in terms of next steps, where do we go from here? So we're at that stage where we have, we basically completed the assessment of the existing condition of the roadway and the infrastructure. So we know what we have. 
Um, we're halfway through identifying opportunities for improvement. So we've got some, some ideas at some high level concepts. That's really the purpose of this evening is to put those out there early, provide the community with an opportunity to reflect on those and share their feedback and identify priorities and concerns. And that will help us to refine those improvement opportunities and ideas and expand those as, as the case may need to be. Once we've done that, we would move into developing alternative designs for how to implement that in the fall of 2022. So that's really where we start to look at exactly what the specific shape, form and function of those things could be and what the impacts are. And then we start really in detail evaluating those alternatives and options versus their impacts, their costs and the benefits that they, they have to offer. So we, we will work through that process in the fall of 2022. That will lead us to a preferred solution that we would bring forward as a preliminary design in a second information session like this one, where we would put that, uh, that preferred solution out there. It'll built on the input from this session and the input we've already received so far from, from various folks online for our join in Northumberland page. Um, and so that would happen in early 2023. We come back with that preferred solution at a fairly high level. We would tweak and refine that based on the, the feedback and input that we would get again. And then we would start to drive that forward towards a detailed design over the, the balance of, uh, of 2023 and culminating in something, a package that we could get ready probably in phases and stages to put out to contractors to bid on and price and build and implement that work in 2024 and beyond as we move forward. So that's kind of what the, the broad strokes lay of the land looks like for where we go from here. So a few things that we, we'd love to hear feedback on, uh, of course, any and all input is, is welcome, but we'd, we'd like to know what, uh, what people think about the two options. So we've just put a little, little recap here of the two options, which is bike lanes and sidewalks, as you can see in the top photo, um, sort of a separated facility. It would look quite a bit like what is there today, just a, a repurposing of the space in a lot of ways versus having a multi-use path constructed on one side and, and sort of revamping the, the side of the road where that multi-use path goes to fit that wider facility in. Um, again, Vanessa walked through some of the traffic calming ideas. They range from, from relatively simple to a little bit more involved and, and physically invasive. Um, it is likely that what we would seek to do is build in a combination of these things so that they work in concert and, and sort of support each other. Certainly we would def and we're definitely looking at these being focused on that gateway area coming into the community, starting in advance of Harbor Street, if you're coming in uh, westbound, uh, coming from the, the rural area, Prince Edward, Quinty West away, and working right up through to, to probably Loyalist and the triangular intersection there uh, with Cedar Street, we, we'd really be looking to focus traffic calming measures in there. And I think curb extensions would be something that would work very well with the pedestrian crossings that we've talked about. Certainly we've heard a lot of early feedback on the need for, for better east-west connectivity across Prince Edward Street so that it's not such a barrier for pedestrians. So we'd certainly like to hear what everybody thinks about various traffic calming options and how they, they would see those fitting in. Um, so as, as we get uh, wrapped up with the presentation here, um, we're hoping to have public input uh, following this meeting We'd love to hear by, uh, by August 10th on, on the main ideas. That doesn't mean we're going to stop listening and close anything off, but we would like to kind of try to corral as many ideas as we can and get everybody's input um, in that, that first part of August so that we can start with the next steps of the process. So in terms of how to do that, um, you can go to join in Northumberland. Uh, there are some links in the presentation um, material here as well and, and post up a public comment online. You can send a note to myself or John um, via a direct email uh, from the who's listening box on the on the right hand side of the page and we'll we'll share that with the project team we've already received a, uh, a good number of those coming into us in advance of this meeting. On the join in page you can subscribe and stay in tune for future materials that will will post which will include this uh, the slide deck from this meeting and uh, and hopefully eventually uh, after we get some uh, transcribing and closed captioning done a, a video recording as well. And then definitely uh, stay tuned into the fall um, for information on what's coming up next year for the, for the next PIC. So with that, thank you very much to everyone for your, uh, your attention and, uh, and time so far this evening. And we look forward to some questions 
offering up answers where we can and, and just receiving feedback from the public. 